Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to part two of episode three of Real Talk with Sean and Bilal, the disorderly cabinet. House of Targs, we talked about his, um, Donald Trump's entire administration in the previous episode, which I encourage you to watch. And now we are going to talk about the construction and deconstruction of the cabinet. Now we get into more of the high profile members of Trump's cabinet and the kind of dynamic they play in his administration overall, as well as the advantages and disadvantages there are in Trump's admittedly unique and kind of unheard of cabinet selections. Um, so obviously we're probably gonna spend a good chunk of it talking about the main three, Secretary of Defense, State, um, and the Secretary of the Treasury. Those are the ones that we're probably going to be focusing, focusing on in order. That is Tillerson for State, Mnuchin for the Treasury, and then Mattis for Defense. Um, and, but then we're also going to get to people that you've heard a lot about. Um, ben Carson as the head of HUD, um, Rick Perry for Energy, um, DeVos obviously for Education. That was really contentious. Um, Kelly for Chief of Staff, the new Chief of Staff and most recent. Um, and then Scott Pruitt, who's the administration, uh, administrator of the EPA. Um, so I will start off with Rex Tillerson. I think this is, this is the one that the, the left had the second worst reaction to. The, the worst one by far was Betsy DeVos. They just hated Betsy DeVos. I think so. I, I feel third. I feel second was Bannon before he was fired. I mean, but I feel like they kind of created, this is the, I'm talking about positions that the Senate had to. Okay. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely second is Tillerson. Because, yeah, Steve Bannon was part of the executive, it was like his own, uh, his own like entourage or whatever um but in terms of people that had to be approved by the senate rex rex tillerson was horrible he was a horrible decision with that said admittedly he's been a pretty okay secretary of state like i'm like this guy he can at least talk the talk by okay i am t um i think you mean okay in terms of what can an exxon ceo about the current geopolitical situations of yeah. different countries of around the world and how the U.S. plays a dynamic in world politics. And so far, Tillerson, I feel like the crumbling relationships or like the deteriorating relationships in many cases with the United States of other countries uh, isn't really due to Tillerson. It's Trump trying to become the de facto Secretary of State and do everyone's job for them by kind of saying flamboyant things. And there's no, uh, Tillerson, the kind of person who wants to be gra uh, grounded, he's the person that represents the super ego, the moralizing figure, one of the moralizing figures in the Trump administration to keep Trump from doing something that's really over the top, uh, too impulsive, even though, I mean, at this point, he's probably done 50 million things in the 10 months, he's been pre nine months he's been president for. Um, one thing about, uh, about Tillerson that I find interesting, obviously Bob, Bo uh, Bob Corker, he's in the news a lot right now. Yeah. Um, and he's going to be giving up his... Um, He's not going to be running for re-election. So what he specifically said about um, about Tillerson after he had been approved, like right after, um, he specifically, uh, as The Hill says, uh, quote, uh, specifically pointed to Russia as one area he expects Tillerson to home in on, quote. Um, now I will be quoting uh, Corker himself, quote, I would say the place that, if I were him, that I would want to be focused is my strategy on the Russia issue. It's one where you know the president seems fairly engaged, and I think as Secretary of State, he probably wants to make sure that he's developed his thinking on how to push back on Putin, quote. So I think he, interesting here is even Repu and Bob Corker now, he is aggressive against Trump. I feel like even here, the GOP had like tinglings that Trump might have been compromised or might have been influenced in some way. So Corker, one of the first things he said is, keep an eye on, on Russia. And now, Tiller, now we don't, is Tillerson compromised? Because Tillerson has had attempted deals within Russia. So now we don't, you're trying to like uncorrupt the guy with the guy that might have been corrupted. It's just layers, man. It's like inception. Yeah. Is it just when you think the dream is over? No, 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 fam. It gets worse. It oh. gets a lot worse. Uh, Tillerson, there's not really much to say about him at this point. He's, he's, he's been pretty good. Uh, he's, he's been pretty good for what is what we expect from an yeah. Exxon CEO to kind of handle the foreign relations of the United States. I think his worst part was the, the press conference he gave just a few days ago um, where he basically admitted that he was Trump's a bitch. He was like... Oh yeah, it's perfectly fine. You know, I might have called Trump a moron, you know, like, uh, but I, now I, I, I'm forced I, to go out. Yeah, I don't focus on this petty nonsense. That's, yeah. that's what he said, which doesn't necessarily disprove of the fact that he called Trump a moron or an epic moron, it's what, whatever it was. And I love how now like MSNBC and Fox and CNN have panelists to, to discuss whether or not Trump's secretary of state called him a moron or an epic moron. That, it's, that is, we've like, we low. have gone so, we, 
we don't we have hit rock like rock bottom is honestly what space is for us right now that is how far below rock bottom we have hit if we're having these discussions with actual political panelists well, forget that we've we've hit rock bottom so hard we've gone through the earth and now we're orbiting back we're like uh, 42 minutes 42 minutes bro think of science fam science but like yeah we, we back in Back in Bill Clinton's day, right? Yeah. The controversy was, but obviously it was sexist because that's like, it was it was still the nineties. Like, you know what I mean, right? Yeah. People were like, Madeleine Albright for Secretary of State. I mean, uh, it's a ch- it was unusual, right? Yeah. That was the biggest controversy. Now we don't know if the pre- if the Secretary of State called the president a fucking moron. That's depressing. That yeah. is sad. That is sad. That's sad exclamation point. Tweak that out. Um, oh, good one. And talking about the the people hating on Trump, blasting Trump, you got your boy James Mattis. Now the thing is with James Mattis, he has so many different layers. Like he's a nationalist, but at the same time he wants to work with other countries. He doesn't want to engage with other countries militarily. I think I think he is one of the most willing top tier cabinet members of the Trump administration that is willing to compromise with the Democratic establishment Definitely. in the Senate and the House. Because he he um called climate change a national security issue before anyone else on either side spoke up about the issue when he was appointed. Um, And that's why you're noticing that like people on the left side of the aisle, they weren't really objecting to the fact that Trump changed uh, part of, I think, what was it, the Constitution or... Not the Constitution, not the Constitution. He changed... Wait, uh, what specific issue are you talking about? Like, um, uh, someone who served in the military couldn't serve in a public servant position like oh, this yeah. this many years yeah, after I get that. It was, retiring. It's, uh, it's not part of the constitution. There was a bill passed. Um, yeah, I, it was a bill. My yeah, bill, yeah bill, it's bill. all good. It's all good. It was basically like um, just for to avoid conflict of interest, which is completely fine. Everyone agreed on this. Um, it's yeah. it's so, recommended that you don't or you shouldn't have a person that's just been in the military as like a general serve in the cabinet, specifically as Secretary of Defense. Now you could have you could get a waiver for that, which Mattis got. Um, and since he got that, and he had democratic support for that, um, I have no qualms with James Mattis. He's shown himself to be loyal to the country, and he has um, shown and he has shown himself to be the mediator between the um, Trump administration yeah. and the Democratic establishment. Like before he, Trump even tried to talk to Pelosi and Schumer, like his number one goal is to make sure that the United States stays. He, he's very much like an Eisenhower. Like very his much. issue isn't politics. His issue is making sure that in times of panic, the country stays stable. Like Eisenhower. Um, it, when he got elected in 52 his main goal wasn't to look at the presidency and say okay how, how can I like rebuild everything right his main goal was okay how am I going to deal with the cold war and that's what he's mostly known for now obviously he's had different programs besides that but what he's known for is the cold war and he handled that pretty well mm-hmm. same thing with James Mattis he's not known for his like for his um Political discussions on should we be uh, should we be uh, interventionist or should we be isolationist? How should we deal with countries like Iran stuff like that? He hasn't voiced his opinion on those issues that much. Yeah. What he has been voicing his issues on is how can I make sure that our president is not like risking us from every on every single day? That he's he's the controller as you mentioned of uh, Trump. He's the, the, yeah, yeah, and he's someone who doesn't want Trump to have a bad yeah. image as well. He wants to keep Trump from doing anything that incriminates himself or um, kind of makes it's himself too stupid. get a bad image. Yeah. Um, Continuing on, you got Steve Mnuchin. Steve Mnuchin. Well, uh, this guy was like discount Tom Price in terms of his <laughs> airfare tickets. Uh, yeah, him and his wife went on a vacation, spent hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars. He Is this like a running theme now, spending hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars? He has a punchable face. Um, Steven, he's like ugly John Oliver, to be honest. Like ugly, this is this is not oh talking God. from a political perspective. I just, Bro. <laughs> but uh. so Steve Mnuchin is the so Secretary cool. of Treasury. He's the former One West CEO. He is one of three CEOs, I believe, in the Trump cabinet. Um, Tillerson's obviously one of them. He's a former Exxon CEO, and the other one's Wilbur Ross, who was a CEO and a billionaire. Um, I forgot what company it was, but. Anyway, Mnuchin is one of them. He's he's the Secretary of Treasury. He's one person that is staunchly, staunchly for uh, reducing the corporate tax rate to I think it was thirty percent or below thirty percent. In fact, twenty nine or twenty eight percent. He wanted to make it easier for them to do business. He wanted to increase the um, debt ceiling to accommodate for more spending decisions to increase aggregate demand, increase the GDP in the short run, and to expand the amount of jobs that the U.S. will be creating to try to make it more um, kind of 
attractive to businesses to come back to uh, manufacturing the country, uh, inside the country rather than in uh, countries such as China and India. He wants those manufacturing jobs right He's a good businessman. He was able to build the majority of his fortune based off of the 2008-2007, other way around, 2007-2008 financial crisis. Um, he basically just, a company was failing, he bought the company, later on he rebuilt it and then sold it. So that, that's fine. Um, and once again, uh, he is a smart guy. He graduated from Yale. So I, I'm not saying that smart people shouldn't be in the cabinet. What I'm saying is smart people that don't have America's best interest at heart shouldn't be in the administration. Yeah. You can take people that don't have training, uh, formal training in the executive branch as much as you would expect, like people like we mentioned, uh, like Eisenhower, uh, like Ulysses S. Grant. But if, you, if they have faith in the country and if they want to do their best for the country, they will succeed. I don't think people like Steve Mnuchin have the best of the country because they're spending so much of our money. Exactly. They don't care about us. They just want to make sure that they get the most out of this uh, cycle or this, this period of time as they can. And just um, one, one thing I want to mention before we get on to our next cabinet member. Um, the reason why Trump, I believe, has still not been able to occupy many key positions, he, he's tried to. I think Hope Hicks was his next uh, communications director and then, uh, I don't know, he tried to appoint a bunch of other people. He's not doing, first of all, the Senate's not confirming it fast enough. And second of all, I believe that by doing this, he's trying to convince his base, most of all, that he's trying to shrink the role of government yeah. in public life. The trying to appoint less and less people in the federal government kind of shows that he is, well, he's trying to basically show that um, rather than being incompetent, he's transferring a lot of the powers that were vested in the federal government in the positions that he is not yet occupied, he's not yet filled, is now going down to the states, which is de facto states' rights. And he's choosing to do that, I feel, without occupying, without um, filling federal level positions. I don't know whether this is going to work. I think this exactly. is going to come off as incompetence as, it's, as it has, oh, for, from a bipartisan point of view. It's just, it's just not going to work. I think Sean hit it right on the nail, right on the head. Uh, earlier I mentioned that like what they're doing is devolution and Sean summarized it perfectly it's basically devolution de facto they're not passing any laws to implement things differently they're just allowing the states to do it and they're not doing anything about it he's just like letting it happen they're letting them rain free um, by not uh, the executive branch as I said it's the bureaucracy so not by not filling up the bureaucracy the federal bu bureaucracy starts to uh, stall up and then the states can take over that role and they can just finish up what needs to be done. Um, now moving on to... Well, so we, we have to mention, now that we've mentioned the Secretary okay. of State, Treasury, and Defense, the recent revelation that all three of them have is the suicide pact. So oh, I yeah. That. All right, so basically, this is something that even took me took me even by surprise. This is amazing. This, 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 is, this is fantastic. This is one of my right. favorite pieces of news. So I've been trapped in exactly. It's, it's, fan it's, like, it's a Captain America level at this point. Um, the suicide pact is basically if Trump chooses to fire either the Secretary of State, Treasury, or Defense, which is Tillerson, Mnuchin, or Mattis, if he even so much as tries to or contemplates firing one of them, then the other two will automatically resign. So if one goes, all go, so he has to keep all of them in order. It, like, he has to prevent himself from firing one of them in order to keep all like, of them. Like, this deceit is working both ways. Trump knows that he has... Mnuchin by the balls because Mnuchin wants to stay in the government. Mattis he can't fire because Mattis is a, a national hero basically and he can't fire Tillerson because he's the most important. That's the one thing preventing because Tillerson um, he said that he's no wait that was on Jeff Sessions excuse me um, but Tillerson said I'm just going to let this Russian investigation happen. I'm not going to hurt relations with Russia. I'm just going to see what happens, and based off of that, I will react. So everyone has some sort of stake in the game. So they're turning it back on Trump. They're saying, oh, oh, you want to threaten us? We're going to threaten you even worse. Because if, if one of us drops, if the Secretary of Treasury left, the economy would take a hit that day. Sec Secretary of Defense leaves that we're exposed militarily. People are going, going, people are going to feel less safe. If the Secretary of State leaves, what are we doing with our foreign policy? Foreign nations are going to become concerned. If all three leaves, oh boy. And, okay. I'm, and I'm telling you, if that happens, if he makes an impulsive decision thinking he can take on the suicide pact, that is going to lead to his resignation. Not even impeachment. He will resign if all three of those leave. Those are basically irreplaceable gover you, government positions at this point. You need to realize the impact this would have. There, there are economic downturns, right? When, when people think that someone's going to resign, right? Like if, if, if Mark, if, let's say this, okay? If a major person says that they want to run for an office, right? Like Donald Trump wants to run for office, the economy takes a bump, right? Donald Trump was the presidency for about a week, he was down, but then it rebounded because it's Donald Trump. They knew he was going to be on their side. 
But if the entire, th this is the bulk of the cabinet. This is the most important part. These have been the people that have been with the government the entire time. There, ha there has not always been a HUD, a secretary of the HUD. There's not always been a chief of staff. There's not even been a secretary of education the entire time. The three that have always been, the original three, are Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, and Secretary of War, which changed into Secretary of Defense. If you have those three fall, the triumvirate, you are going to fail and collapse like Caesar and the Roman Republic. It's not going to last. You cannot afford that. And if he does think he can afford it, you're done. You can't. The Congress will either impeach him or he will resign because the backlash will be insane. This, this... This suicide pact is the only thing keeping him in power because as soon as one of them leaves, the entire cabinet leaves, you can blame incompetence on him instantly and boom, you are done. Absolutely. Whew, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to go in. I had to go in. Now that we've gone that out of the way, that shocking revelation still at this point, it's the bang, pretty bang. shocking. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move on to the Secretary of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, <laughs> Ben Carson. And I don't know how to react to this, to be honest. Ben, ben, Carson, himself, ben Carson himself said the day that Trump announced that um, he would be announcing him he as know. the like, what? HUD Secretary. Not only did he not know, after he found out, his spokesperson uh, personally told the Trump administration that he lacks um, experience to occupy this position because you know he was just a presidential candidate who ran on expert um, not expletives who ran on political talking points and he was a neurosurgeon a world class neurosurgeon but you know he doesn't really have any political expertise no, hence his um, spokesperson said you know there's no point in him occupying this position if you made him if you instead of the current position right i think the some of the people are okay like, I don't agree with Scott Pruitt and his positions of energy. Oh, yeah, obviously not. I don't agree with Rick Perry with energy at all. Because he didn't even... The Secretary of Energy is... Uh, the Department of Energy, they deal with nuclear weapons. He didn't know that. He thought he was under Secretary of Energy. He wanted to get rid of it in the 2012 uh, Republican debate. Yeah, he... So now he's on that. So, okay. He's I not... Not only is he on that, he's the Secretary He's of the it. Secretary of it. I would have changed a lot of these around. What I would have done... Rick, hear me out, okay? I'd personally make Ben Carson the Surgeon General. The surgeon general. That would make sense, right? You make him the surgeon general. You what you I would have made. Imagine Rex Tillerson as the secretary of energy. That would make sense because he's a former exile. If he made that, I'd be like, I don't agree with it. It seems super corrupt and sus, but I get the logic. And then make Rick Perry secretary of state. That makes sense. That and then I bet I Romney was also a good option, but he was a part of oh, the establishment. Shit. If he appointed oh. Romney then everybody would have gone against him I, in a heartbeat. I, 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 I was thinking back. I was talking to my dad about this. Space. I would be like, I, I love Romney. So, like, if, if the elect in 2012, right? If I was there with my current views, I probably would have voted for Mitt Romney. Because uh, have you heard of, um, well, he's Massachusetts, right? Massachusetts had great health care, and they have great health care. Like, he, he fixed the system. And he knows how to run health care. That's one of his main issues. So, if in 2012... Mitt Romney would have been a great president, presidential candidate. I've, in, in 2012, I can't say that I wouldn't support Romney. Because Romney, oh my god. I, I'm missing Romney so much. I miss Romney, dude. Romney represented political centricism. He was just a dad. He was a, he was, you know what Romney was? He was the culmination. There, there's been a dance going on, like this realignment since 1988. Since, like what happened is, in 1988, right? You had George H.W. Bush carry the mantle of the conservative party, the conservative coalition that had formed Reagan, okay? So then the, the Democratic – so now you have this, okay? You have the, the left party or the Democratic party coming towards the right. And then the, the, once again, this is kind of happening. It's kind of like an exponential curve, right? What happens is as the Democratic party approaches the center, they can't touch it obviously, right? So it's kind of like when uh, when you're approaching limits in uh, calculus, you you can't you're approaching the asymptote, but you can never quite touch it. And so then Mitt Romney, he was kind of the Republican version of that. So you have in 2012 the epitome of just two asymptotes approaching each other at zero. Okay, mm -hmm. but you know what Trump was? Trump took the entire thing on its head. He said no, the asymptote had been approaching zero. He went backwards on it, and he's going to go straight out. He's going to go out towards infinity. He's not approaching zero anymore. He's going towards infinity. So that's the backlash. The backlash of having two people that are basically the same politically, like Mitt Romney and Obama, center-left, center-right, nearly exactly the same positions. 
the backlash to that was Donald Trump. Because both parties didn't really have a position at this point. They're kind of just saying the same thing, differently worded. Mm -hmm. The emotions were different, and that's why identity politics has failed for the left. So yeah. I don't know how we got to that, what Mitt Romney is. Who were we even talking about before that? Rick Perry? Ben Carson. Ben Carson. Oh, yeah, and, and Rick Perry. Like, we're we, talking about everyone. Yeah, we, uh, talked, we got through those two. There's not really much to say about him. I mean, the most prolific Ben Carson has been of late. Has he loves been, under a Yeah, and like uh, I think yesterday, him and Maxine Waters had an exchange about Maxine. And Maxine Waters, like she does with everybody, she went off on him about why Trump should be impeached. Oh, why he, she, does. he why, does. Why he why he keeps why uh, Ben Carson keeps defending Trump. You they know, all, all, all that kind of stuff. Ass. Yeah, and ben, and basically interrupting Ben Carson and then re re reclaiming her time when he tries to talk. You know, all that kind of stuff. The good, the basic good basic Maxine Waters. Story. The good roast fam. The uh, blasting him, my dude. Um. <laughs> Have okay, so that's Ben Carson and Rick Perry. <laughs> Rick Perry. Oh, dude. Now let's go to Betsy DeVos. <laughs> oh, shit. What, what was this? 50-50, 51-50? Yeah, Mike oh. Pence had to break that tie oh. of, of Betsy DeVos. So there were Republicans that voted against DeVos. I think it was Murkowski and Collins. I think. Yeah, it was Murkowski. They were, yeah, they were so the... Was it? Definitely I Murkowski. Definitely, definitely, definitely Murkowski and Collins. I think it was uh. one other person, too, who was from the Republican Party who voted against uh, Betsy DeVos. And there was good reason, too. I mean, she had a bunch of gaps in her uh, Senate hearing... She said that she would allow guns on um, school grounds, like public school grounds, to um, uh, protect yeah, kids right. it was on, in, in the West Fox. against potential grizzlies. What the hell that mean? I mean, like it against grizzly bears because apparently that was her prior need. That she prioritized that over the fact that she had to reduce tuition costs oh, yeah, of people yeah. in this country. Tuition, the, like yeah, let's ignore the fact that tuition costs in this country are rising at exponential levels. Rent prices are rising, but that's another topic itself. But the rising tuition prices are not even being mentioned by the um, by. Yeah. Let's forget that student loans are the most vicious types of loans, right? Let's forget that public colleges need to be free to make sure that we have a more educated next generation to counter the rest of the world, which is doing the exact same thing. Let's ignore the fact that people go into college debt-free, credit cards will be fine, and they'll leave college with a few thousand, tens of thousands of dollars worth of debt, debt, and that's just a bachelor's degree. Let's ignore the fact debt that- Debt with our, interest. Debt with interest, and it's in bankruptcy. Steve, uh, that type of debt is the one that you cannot write off. It stays with you for the rest of your life. It's like tar. It will never leave you. Uh, let's ignore the fact that, in, especially in the Midwest and in the South, education is starting to fail. Let's ignore the fact that you know, stuff like abstinence education it has failed. Let's ignore the fact that we're not teaching evolution in school. Let's ignore all of that. And you know what we should do? Let's reinvigorate charter schools. Let's take away funding from public schools where the majority of people go and plug them back into private schools that have nothing to do with our education system. Why is she, why the Trumps here qualified? She didn't. He just wanted to see, oh, rich people would get benefit from the charter schools. Let's just do that. Betsy DeVos had funded his camp, or he had economic relations to Betsy DeVos. I'm not sure if she funded his campaign directly, but I'm almost positive that there are economic ties between herself, her brother, and Trump. Let's, yeah, ignore, she, let's um, ignore all the flaws in the education system, and let's just help ourselves. Her family has funded a lot of uh, senators, especially right before her uh, confirmation vote. Uh, the hundreds of thousands of dollars she gave to several senators. I don't have the link right now. I think we'll also we'll, we'll put it uh, down below. Not even that. Um, on top of that, uh, very recently, her stance on sexual assault in college has been... Oh, Are you talking about Title Nine? Not Title Nine, but yeah, ta Title yeah. She st she stripped some Title Nine regulations as well. But yeah, just basically what happened was um, she wanted to prevent in what was in her case, air quote me on this, um, school overreach to stop uh, when it came to when it came to sexual harassment cases because she she blamed a lot of girls in college claiming victimhood for rape. Uh, and sexual assault that maybe was not there and the school administration in investigating this it um, really took a lot of public dollars out of the government's payroll so this is what she was trying to combat she wanted to make it so that the um, funding goes to the police and the police of the uh, community um, in which the college is in where students report uh, sexual assault cases those cases are handled by the police, basically, rather than administration officials from the school, because she feels like that is an ineffective allocation of resources from the government. Yeah, she voted, uh, she initially donated, to, uh, I just looked this up. And by the way, 
for our information, most all of it either comes from Wikipedia or The Hill and The New York Times. Like, that's where we mostly find our sources. Yeah. Um, so, like, if we get, like, a small fact wrong, like, oh, he didn't say this in July, he said this in June, please don't blast us. <laughs> um, we're still kind of running low tech here. Um, but, yeah, she initially j- uh, donated to Jeb Bush and Carly Fiorina, it seemed like. Then she began supporting Marco Rubio. Um, and then she said that he does not represent the, quote, he does not represent the Republican Party, quote. Um, so she initially tore into Trump. Then they announced that he would be the uh, the education secretary. But why? Like, can you see any reason? Like, I, I explained my Yeah, problem. I can see one reason. A ton of money. Oh, boy, yeah. It was, it was good. That She's, she herself said unapologetically she is the one of the single, well, her family, uh, rather, is, is the single largest funder of soft money to the National Republican Party, ever. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's not something to be un- unapologetic about, especially after you get a position in, the, in his cabinet, in the federal cabinet, oh. under a, a Republican president. So that wasn't quite ideal. Um, her stance on sexual assault has been already, you know, I personally don't believe that there is a sexual harassment culture in colleges because statistically, um, I think the stat is on average from all colleges, Three out of a hundred reported rape cases are real, and they're adjudicated um, officially by uh, courts, by the school, uh, by um, that ad- administrate. Um, the hell was I trying to say? Um, basically, they're ruled on properly. Now, how many rapes that go unreported actually happen? That is something that we ha- still have yet to uncover because we don't have the statistics on that. Because obviously, we cannot track down people who were sex- uh, sexually assaulted, actually sexually assaulted, but did not report it to the administration officials. She wants to get rid of that mediating barrier between the student and the police. She wants to get rid of that administration overreach, and she wants the students to go directly to the police. That I, that might work. That might be a better allocation of resources. The way she said it, she says, if everything is assault, then nothing is assault, or uh, something like that. Um, I don't think that's personally the best way to go about uh, conveying your position to the American no. people because you're basically making light of something that affects teenage girls and uh, college students as a whole, not even girls, girls and boys alike, uh, on a daily basis, especially when they're that young. Yeah, like, when, it, when it comes, right? What it comes down to is, can I trust you with my kids? I don't think a lot of people do with her. Mm-hmm. Um, what, one other thing I would like to think is interesting, as we mentioned, it was a 50-51 vote. Um, and the qu- this is from Wikipedia, quote, um, and Senator Jeff Sessions, who himself had been nominated by the Trump administration for the post of United States Attorney General, Republicans scheduled Sessions' confirmation vote after DeVos's so that he'd be able to cast his vote in, in support of DeVos. Quote. So if he had been, as soon as you get uh, support, uh, have, as soon as you get a position in the cabinet, right, you have to resign from all, all others to prevent mm-hmm. a, um, a conflict of interest. So they, pl- they knew they were cutting it down to the wire because she's just been destroyed by everyone. She's been torn apart. And um, now we're going to move on to Scott Pruitt. <laughs> well, well, Scott Pruitt himself is not is a uh, climate change denier, saying that the climate levels of the planet have been relatively stable for the last couple centuries. He's a firm believer that the EPA policies implemented under the Obama administration in the Obama era were over-regulatory, they were business-killing, they killed the coal industry, and that's why you're seeing on almost a um, monthly basis he is repealing key Obamacare EPA regulations. Uh, Whether or not I disagree with it, well, right now um, we're learning stuff about environmental science and climate change is a more complicated issue than people kind of overgeneralize it to be, that the left and the right both kind of overgeneralize it to be. Um, it's, It's not an issue where you can definitively say, this is what needs to be done. You need to implement a carbon tax. It's much more complicated than that. And believe it or not, the US is one of the biggest contributors in de detoxifying the climate. Um, a lot of U.S. companies instead do it in China. There's a lot of plants in Europe, in fact, and ironically, the EU placed strict sanctions on any country in the European Union that um, emitted a lot of carbon emissions, but they emit more carbon emissions per head, per capita, than the United States. So the U.S. in that regard, and I think it's largely due to Obama-era regulations um, of the Environmental Protection Agency, that is the reason why the U.S. has cut back on... Um, regulation. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, not the regulation. That cut back on the carbon emissions that this country emitted, basically. The, the, I, I find it so odd that people don't support climate change at this point. Like, I talk to people in school, and they're like, oh, the scientific consensus isn't in yet, or it just doesn't make sense. But when the majority of scientists say it makes sense, that they've been able to prove it with results, with evidence, you should support it. Now, that's not to say that scientists haven't been wrong in the past. In the past. But when scientists have been shown evidence that they're wrong, they are some of the first people to change. Like when, uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, Ch uh, Charles Darwin published um, The Origin of Species, he never had, uh, there was little conflict within the scientific community. Within about two decades, the majority of them agreed. And the climate change has not been going on for two, like, uh, sorry, did I say two centuries? Yeah, something like that. Oh, well, within two decades, had agreed. Now, uh, look, the idea of climate change has been going on for decades, not 10, 20, 30. It's been going on for like 50, 60 years. And the scientific consensus is yes, carbon dioxide and pollution are causing the climate, to, uh, the climate temperature and heat to rise at a rate that, is not, that would not happen naturally. And, and it's very likely due to human um, intervention or at least a human cause. How can you ignore that? Like, I'm fine disagree with it but at least back it up with evidence don't say that oh we shouldn't regulate it because like our, we're not we're going to make less money at some point you have to realize yeah the world is kind of better than how much your stock is worth um, um now you want to move on to john kelly john kelly i love john kelly For, uh former secretary of homeland security now the chief of staff once again one of those people not the, the chief of staff has kind of lost its position now because of, like i feel like mattis has taken up that role not the position of chief of staff but that what it embodies de facto um i feel like um john kelly he's kind of lost his grip on trump um yeah and john kelly himself i think one of his spokespeople he uh they said that john kelly is in the administration right now solely to keep trump from doing something super impulsive and that's why it's very important that he stay chief of staff for as long as trump is president because he's the one person that can keep him grounded. He's the one person that can keep him from doing anything that's politically um, impulsive. He had a, you gave a briefing yesterday? Well, apparently so. I, I, I didn't know he... Uh, I wasn't aware of this. The, the, the articles have just been published today. But um, yeah, keep, keep going on for a second. I'll find a... Uh, yeah, uh, basically though, John Kelly was the former Secretary of Homeland Security under whom um, illegal immigration rates the, uh, of uh, crossing the southern border went down almost 83%, I believe, what it was when he was last the uh, DHS. And then after Reince Priebus was fired as the chief of staff, John Kelly was implemented. John Kelly has since been with Trump with almost in almost every meeting. He's basically the more like credible Jared Kushner at this point for Trump. Uh, <laughs> we we were going to talk about Jared Kushner, but at this point he's so irrelevant and he's so out of the news. He's pretty, he's we don't feel like he's yeah. We he's, don't feel need to talk about. He's it at all. keeping himself intentionally out of the spotlight because as soon as it goes back onto him, the Russian investigation pops up. Yeah, um, him and McMaster have done really well in dealing with the media when it comes to oh, yeah. them questioning Trump's uh, tactics and what Trump wants to do about nuclear proliferation, North Korea, Russia, um, Puerto Rico as well. Uh, in fact, yesterday, I think Mattis uh, and John Kelly simultaneously uh, in a different press briefing said that Trump wanting to increase the uh, U.S.'s nuclear arsenal, that was complete horse apple. Right? It's, it's just not true. So the, the fact that he takes that role, that active role in the administration to correct Trump, to correct the media about their perception of Trump, despite Trump ruining that for himself 99% of the time on most of the occasion, um, is very commendable of him, and I think he is the, one of the key members, if not the most important member of his cabinet so far. Kelly? He's, he's up there. He's up there. I wouldn't say most important. The top three are obvious, the Tillers and Mnuchin and Mattis, and then right after that, I have Yeah, after that, Chief Staff, I feel like the nature of the Chief Staff has kind of changed. Now, they used to be, right? Setting the agenda, helping them plan out. Now, I feel like it's kind of just become like a regular secretary. Like, not secretary of anything, secretary of the president. That's exactly. what it feels like. I feel like everything else... The issues that he's touted, those have kind of come to the forefront, and that's the important things that people are focusing on. So yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, one thing, just just quickly before we wrap up, uh, about uh, Jeff Sessions, who is currently the Attorney General. Uh, I kind of, I like what Jeff Sessions is doing. He recused himself from the Russian investigation, which is commendable. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on Jeff Sessions, just because he, as the Attorney General, he's supposed to be 
nonpartisan. He's kind of acting in a partisan manner, but it's not to the point where like he needs to be removed or it's in a deplorable nature. It's just kind of like with the attorney general, how do you uh, look at the laws? What do you feel should be right? Now, has he been like man? Has he been like forced by Trump to do some stuff? Absolutely, yes. But then again, President Trump has done that. George Bush has done that. Every president has done that. Uh, so people were obviously probably in the comments or just responding to us saying that, going to say that, you know, why didn't we mention Jeff Sessions? We didn't mention Jeff Sessions because we didn't feel like he had done anything extraordinarily noteworthy. Other than recusing himself, but like that was way early on in the uh, beginnings of the Trump administration. So not a lot to say about Sessions, but I think we definitely talked a lot about the other parts of the top tier of the Trump administrative cabinet. And um, we're just going to wrap it up here. Yeah, so we, we uh, talking about that, we definitely agree that in terms of attorney generals, it would be better to focus on Sally Yates rather than Jeff Sessions. Um, so that's that. Um, so yeah, guys, thank you once again. This has been, we're not sure as of this point if we're going to be breaking up into one episode or we're going to be breaking up into two, but no matter what happens, um, we want to thank you um, for listening to our podcast. As always, please keep up the support. You guys have been great recently. Um, so yeah, that's just about it. This has been Real Talk with Bilal and Sean. Thank you.